Council of the whole committee, Tuesday, March 24th, 2015, to order. We have one item on the agenda tonight, 02115, Larry Casasa, Acting Community Development Director, to approve the sale of BF Brown School to Fitchburg Affordable Housing Corporation, 470 Main Street, Fitchburg, Mass., as outlined in the enclosed petition. Before we have the uh, petitioner and others come forward to answer questions and uh, make comments with the council, I am going to offer um, those in attendance here tonight the opportunity to come forward just like we would at a public uh, forum part of a regular council meeting and have a minute or two to comment on uh, whether you approve of this or you, or you disapprove and then we will get to our part where we talk and there's no discussion or comment from the um, members of the audience. Would anybody like to say anything before we start? Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Hi. My name is Colin McEninch. I live at 127 Cedar Street in Fitchburg. I wanted to just um, extend my extreme support for this. I've heard many people in Boston that I deal with who are desperately looking for a better place to live for artists, work, living space. And these are also people who are looking to build a community and live in a community and help create a community. I would also like to speak to the unique nature of moving artists into a building like this. You're essentially moving in a whole bunch of independent business owners. It's a little different than a standard tenant moving in who's just finding a place to sleep at night. You are moving somebody in whose job it is to survive by building an entire fan base, by reaching out and building a community, and it makes a unique aspect for the type of tenant you're bringing in. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to comment? Robert? Evening. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm here in, in my role as uh, the president of the Fitchburg Art Museum and want to express my full support of this. Uh, for the record, let us know who you are. I'm sorry. That's okay. Bob Gallo, uh, resident of Fitchburg as well. Uh, again, as, as the um, president of the Art Museum, uh, we're, we see this as a huge opportunity for us very excited about this project moving forward. Uh, I also want to make a point that I'm, uh, as a vice president of Workers' Credit Union, a corporate neighbor of this property. Uh, we fully support uh, f this project and, and we'd love to see it move forward uh, for biz business reasons and neighborhood reasons as well uh, and see nothing but positive coming out of this. Um, we're actively uh, involved in, in uh, the CDC and some of their other projects um, and see their expertise and, and experience uh, being sufficient to be able to see this project through as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, my name is Anna Clementi. I'm a lifelong resident of the area, mostly Lemonster and Lunenburg, but I used to come to Fitchburg shopping with my mom all the time as a kid. Um, I am a, I'm on the board of trustees at the Fitchburg Art Museum and also Fitchburg State University. I'm head of education at the Fitchburg Art Museum. I think it is imperative that the building become part of the Fitchburg landscape in an artistic way. I believe that the creative economy will give back to the community in ways we can only imagine. Um, I, I speak to my children. They talk about maker spaces today where there are 3D printers, where there's a collaborative energy in the community. I think we need to be proactive. We have to be innovative and we have to go with the times. And I think we need to take a courageous move in taking this building and, and bringing Fitchburg back to a very vibrant community that it once was. I, I, I think we need to have courage and not fear and go ahead with this purchase, this building, um, that will become an integral part of 
Pittsburgh in a walking community where people will come and see artists at work and, and uh, children can enjoy and the students at the university can also become part of this undertaking. I think it's exciting. I think it's imperative that we do it and um, as a member of the Board of Trustees of the University and the Art Museum, I would say both communities would be very enthusiastic to have this be part of the community and I think we just need to have some courage and some innovative thinking and bring this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment? You'll be next, Alan. Um, my name is Leandro Lopez, and I'm currently studying art in Boston. And uh, personally, I would love an artist, affordable artist housing and uh, workspace in Fitchburg. Um, I grew up in Fitchburg, and uh, yeah, it seems like a great idea to me, and I'd definitely be there waiting for it to open up. Thank you. Alan Di Geronimo. I live at 197 Bridal Cross Road, and I'm here as an alumni of B.F. Brown Junior High School. It's called in my day. And I want to tell you that what I remember most about those two years at B.F. Brown was the joy of coming together with children from all over the city of Fitchburg for the first time. We all came from our little grammar schools to Academy Street, and in thinking back, it was a true melting pot right there. Now, I'm not, I am absolutely supportive of this project. I respect that all of you have lots of things to consider in your deliberation and your decision making, but I would just ask you to turn and look at this collage. When I came in this evening, I was kind of had time to look at it carefully. And I thought this is a perfect, there's a message here for all of us. It says, honor the past and imagine the future. And that's what we're asking you to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Kelly? Hi, guys. Um, my name is Kelly Johnson. I'm a Fisherman resident. Um, I discussed this um, issue with my ward counselor, and I think I brought some things to light with her um, that I'm looking forward to her discussing tonight. Um, our discussion was part of the low income portion of this, um, and maybe the sort of fear um, that goes along with it. And I'd like you all to realize that low income doesn't necessarily mean um, that there's a certain face to it. Um, I myself, because I only work part-time, can be a larger part of the community. Um, I'd al also like, even though I'm not an artist, um, I'd like to point out two people who I've met in the art community who became young parents um, and really stuck it through would be um, Ryan Gardell and Nikki Stees. Um, Ryan was part of the Revival Gallery on Main Street, unfortunately didn't survive, however, um, being low-income individuals and being artists, you know, if we could give them a foundation to have somewhere to live, to raise their son, to be a part of the community. Ryan was a driving force behind the 250. Um, he made pins. He was the designer for the um, Key to the Future logo, and he was able to do that because he loved what he was doing. So if we can look at individuals like that and know that potentially giving their, them somewhere um, to live, to work, um, to be a part of the community, then they'll for certain um, bring business to Main Street. Anyone else wishing to speak? Been heard, we'll move forward and we'll ask Mr. Sassa and Mr. Capasio and Ms. Doan to come forward to the table. Counselors, the gentleman came before us before and made a presentation 
They've since given us some written documentation um, regarding their, their agreement. Um, I would just like to open it up to counselors to, to ask questions and have the three of them be available um, for answers. Anybody have any questions or comments that they'd like to make? Council Boschman. I got a question from Larry Kishasa. Probably a lot of questions for Larry Kishasa. So Larry. Probably or you do? I do. Okay. A lot of questions. <coughs> Larry, you and I have talked and talked and talked for months on end. Since January 6th to now about this Pierre Brown project. If you and I were standing in front of the former GE building, now known as City Hall, and we went on top of the roof, and we looked towards Espresso Pizza, as far as your eye can see, is it fair to say, or safe to say, that 50% or better are below poverty level? The, the census tract, or block group of the census tract, in the area surrounding BF Brown property is about 50% um, below the poverty level currently, according to the latest census information. Okay, so now we turn 180 degrees, and we look on the other side of the river, and we study that area and we look. Is it fair to say that we're 30% above the, uh, below the poverty level, 30%? I, I, from your description, I, I believe you're talking about an area that is also, uh, yes, above 30 uh, percent in poverty. So now, if you and I take a 360-degree turn and we look around, the way I understand this map, between 70 and 90 percent of the people in that area are just barely making it. Am I right or wrong the way I was told from you? Well, what, what, what I, I believe we talked about, Councillor, was that um, between 70 and 90 percent fall under what's called low and moderate income standards for the programs that we typically operate, the federal programs. And that basically means that the average household or, um, earns less than 80 percent of the area median income. Um, and the area would be Fitchburg, Lemonster, and the surrounding towns. So uh, they are lower income than the average for that entire area. So basically, if you're saying a guy makes fifty thousand dollars and he makes eighty percent, that would be forty forty thousand in that area. I don't call that low income. I call that moderate, better than moderate. Forty thousand is. Am I right or wrong? Well, lo low and moderate income is what they what they mean when they say less than eighty percent of area <laughs> median income. No. As I was driving around the city today, and I did drive around the city, because I keep on hearing this is going to be a positive thing for the city of Fitchburg, and it's going to be probably a boom, you're saying to me. This is the way I'm hearing it. I drive down John Fitch Highway, and I see 10 storefronts vacant. Oh, sorry about that. Nine storefronts vacant. I come to the gateway of the city, the gateway to the dining room of our city, which is Water Street. We got vacant land and empty buildings. I go down to Water Plaza. We got four buildings empty, possibly five with the move of CVS if they decide to build, and when they build, or if they decide to move it. I go up to Park Hill. We got another four buildings empty storefronts. I go into Lower Claygon, my part of the town. Once factories that used to sing no longer sing. Sit beer, no music, and no noise. Empty. I see, and I drive around, and I see 634 closes in the city of Fitzbury between January 1st to October 14th of this year. 634 closes. I see our stocks, housing stocks, go down 33 and one quarter percent. I see our skilled labor, we're not skilled. In the city of Fitchburg, we cannot compete. We cannot compete. It says it in the and I didn't make this up. It's from the, the Chamber of Commerce. We cannot compete. Our school system gives 80% of free lunches, but now we went to 100%. 80% free 
sorry, 70 to 80 percent free lunches. All this is a bearing of why I don't want more low income housing. I'll bargain, I mean, I'll compromise, because politics is about compromising. If the CDC comes back and says to me, we're going to give you more market rate housing, I'll have no problem with it. But give me more, my, and I'm not talking about one more or two more, more market rate housing. Written down that there's no subsidize in it. That the guy at the average rent is going to be $1,150, that's what he pays without no subsidize. And I'll back it. Other than that, if they say no, then they answer their own question with me. I say no. Can we do it? And the other thing I would like to see, Mayor and Larry, if we have an independent guy come in without no political aspiration or whatsoever, none whatsoever, on 28 of his thing, he comes in and if they're not living up to their term, he pulls the plugs and nothing happens to him. He says, no, we're not doing the deal. And I'll buy that. And I'll go with it. All in writing. So this way here, nothing happens. Can that be done, Larry? I, I do believe that it's possible um, that the number of market rate units in this project can be increased. And I think there's an understanding uh, among all the parties involved that that's going to be the goal. Where we are right now is that the city published an RFP, the CDC responded to the RFP with their proposal, and that proposal was just based on what was available at the time of the proposal. Actually developing a project like this, especially one that's going to cost close to $20 million, I believe, um, involves probably a process that's going to take a couple of years to assemble all of the financing necessary. Um, Mr. Doan wasn't able at the time of the proposal to commit more than 30 percent market rate units because that process is, is a two-year process. I'm hopeful, based on my understanding of the fact that the state is beginning to recognize that gateway cities need more market rate housing, not more um, restricted units, as opposed to the, the uh, programs that have traditionally been funded with an eye toward helping communities that, that are more affluent and that have a problem with gentrification. Their concern, the concern of Eastern Massachusetts has always been, how can we make more affordable housing and lock up more affordable housing so that the people who grew up in communities around Boston could still live in their communities because the price of housing had gotten too high. Unfortunately, that, oh, that painting the entire state with that entire brush has created a problem for gateway cities like Fitchburg, which already has a high percentage of affordable housing. That's not the problem in Fitchburg. The problem in Fitchburg is lack of investment and a lack of income integration. We don't have enough people who have money. Mm -hmm. The state be has begun to recognize that. The gateway cities have formed uh, a, 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 a legislative caucus. Um, there are two or three new programs that have been funded, not, not, not adequately, mind you, but they have been funded, that <coughs> encourage market rate housing, and that certainly Mark is interested in pursuing and that the city is interested in helping him obtain. Um, our hope is that over the course of the next couple of years, this, the legislature will, in fact, appropriate more money that can be used for market rate housing and that that will enable us to increase the percentage of units that uh, will be market rate in this project. And I think that's an important part of its success because we really do have an area in the downtown that's poverty stricken right now. I, I think that's a fair characterization. And it's very difficult uh, to imagine a lot of retail growth or a lot of restaurant growth in the downtown unless we have a better mix. We have people at, at both ends of the spectrum living in the downtown, people who can afford to shop uh, in the downtown and who can afford to eat out of the restaurant a couple nights a week. So that is the goal. It's been our policy for some time and we're trying to work with the fiscal realities that we have and trying to to encourage um, you know the, the, the state to provide more funding for that purpose. So it's a two-year process is essentially what I'm saying. Yeah, I understand. 
Now, my other thing, what I have a hard time with, and really, and if I seem like I'm upset, I'm in my 60s, and I'm not going to live to be 160. And I don't have a lot of time to see, wait 40 years, because I'll be well over 100. So I look at my kids, and I look at the young students of today, and what they have is empty buildings, dilapidated buildings, empty storefronts. And I see, and I get mad when I read in the paper, and I see, and I drive down to Commercial Ave, and I go to Home Depot, and I see on the left-hand side a big bank that used to be an icon in Fitchburg. And if I'm upset, I am upset. It's called Fidelity. Fidelity. And they're going to give us a little branch, but they put a big office worth, worth well over $2 million. And then we had another bank, a nice bank. It was called out the Fitchburg. But, but, they had to go and change their name because I'm told marketing, marketing purposes, just like Great Wolf, you can't say Fitchburg on TV, we've got to say Central Mass. So they changed it to Rollstone Bank. We all bought it. We all bought it, lump, lump, and everything else. And then all of a sudden I read in the paper, they buy Monument Square. They tear down the building. And they build a beautiful building down in Monument Square. Then I read in the paper that they donated $5,000 to charity. And they called us the branch because their headquarters is downtown Lemonster. We lost things. We lost the things. Counselor, the, the counselor. Country. Uh, I'm not quite sure how business is going is all, to, to Low income housing, sir, it's all economic development, and it, it's showing you that what's happening to our Fitchburg, what's happening to Fitchburg, because we're, we're saturated with low income housing. We can't breathe. We have nothing coming in. We got everything going out because we are stagnant because of low income housing. Drive around the city and see the empty apartments. Drive around C the city. Counselor, counselor. I'm not disagreeing or agreeing with you, and that is your opinion, and that's fine. I'm just trying to tie it to the B.F. Brown School project, oh, and Amanda, as, as, one, opposed, as opposed to giving us a history lesson of, of Fitchburg and its economic challenges over the last 30 or 40 years. But well, sure, if we don't face the facts, this is why we are stagnant, because nobody has ever come out and says anything like this before, so we're all shocked. So you're the first person to talk about Fitchburg's economic challenges, okay? I, I'm not, no, I'm not the first person, Steve. I am not the first person. That's what you just said, Paul. No, no, because nobody brought it up as a whole group like this. We've all got blinders on. What? I think we've got blinders I'm, I'm on. I'm just asking you to try to stay. Right. No, I'm to a, go ahead, Larry. No, I'm go ahead. No, I'm all right, Mr. President. You, well, you weren't even asking a question at the end. You were just... Uh, I'm just giving them an example of what I feel why I want more market rate housing, sir. Okay, that's understandable. <clears throat> Councilor Di Natale. Thank you, Mr. President. The uh, B.F. Brown Agreement has a very important clause in it. Uh, it states, quote, under Sellers Contingency 20A, that the agreement is contingent upon Fitchburg's final approval of the project set forth where there needs to be an approved feasibility study, market studies, and financial projections provided by the CDC. The study shall demonstrate the feasibility of developing the premises with no less than 30% market rate residential units, and also for the purpose of artist housing. The CDC has six months from the date of the agreement to provide Fitchburg as the studies outlined. If Fitchburg is not satisfied that the project can be developed as artist housing, Fitchburg may terminate this agreement within six months of the date of the agreement. It's important to understand why this clause is in the agreement, and that is because in speaking with Mr. Casasa several weeks ago, who also served on the B.F. Brown Committee, the clause was inserted due to previous studies that have already been given. Those studies were deemed invalid. Those studies indicated the, the, the opinion from Mr. Casasa was that they did not cite comparable areas like Fitchburg, had different tenant incomes and did not consider what the likely market would be in our area, suggesting simply that we could expect 22 to 36 out of 55 units occupied by artists at best. The remaining 19 to 33 would be occupied by non-artists. I point this out because everyone in this room 
loves to hear about a vision and they love to hear about what could be. Unfortunately for me, I like to deal in the realm of <coughs> facts. The facts that have been provided so far indicate that this is not going to be viable. And if it is viable, it's not viable at the level we all want it to be. For this facility to ba basically be at best half of professionals doesn't cut it for me. It has to be all or nothing. There could very well be an instance, and this is not stopping the CDC from doing this, that they can rent it to anybody. So my issue is not low income. My issue is everybody's voting for this tonight in favor, possibly, because of the vision of the art collaboration. Yet studies that have already been provided prove it's not viable, and we have yet to see the additional studies done. And my further concern is the language is vague. Who in this city is going to determine that that study is valid? Who in this city is going to determine, well, it's not valid, but we'll let them go forward and do what they want anyway, because everyone in this room is looking first at getting rid of that building versus what that building is going to become. And I'm not going to take that approach. If this is not going to be geared to 100% young art professionals who do out of college make not a lot of money, like I did when I got out of school, I was making $30,000 a year. I won't support this. And there is nothing in the agreement that precludes them from renting it to other people. And they can't rent it to just artists because of the way they're funded. This is a taxpayer-funded organization that has to have this be 70% low-income subsidized or else they can't do this project which bodes the question, if it's not good for a private developer, why is it good for a public one? A private developer has his or her own money. The CDC doesn't have any money. They get it from the people. This is not a knock on the CDC. They do great work for us, but I'm trying to everybody to understand why I have reservations about this project. There are several facilities throughout the downtown that are low income. And before anybody starts to think that I am going to talk about negatively about low income people, they can walk out because that's not what I'm saying. I am talking about what Larry just said earlier about income integration. We have a problem in the downtown, not because there are low income people who live there, but because that's all that lives there. We don't have a balance, ladies and gentlemen. We just don't. You need to have low, medium, and high wage earners in an area, and that's where the businesses will go. Businesses are not going to come to an area where there's no disposable income. So there is a great imbalance in the downtown. This project will not correct that imbalance. It will further the imbalance. So this is not a knock on low-income people. I have two close relatives that are on Medicaid and Social Security disability. I understand low-income people, okay? This is not about not wanting them here. This is about a balance. We are imbalanced, and we continue to imbalance ourselves by doing this. If this project goes forward and there's only five or ten artists that live out of these 55 units, how does that benefit the vision that we're all talking about? It won't. It, it, it won't unless it's all. Because when Mr. Capasso and Mr. Doyle were here on February 3rd, I went home and I said to myself, I have to keep a more open mind about this. Because I was being unfair with my original assertion of what this is going to be. And I said, if this is going to be strictly geared to professionals in the art field, then this is something different. This is something unique. But all of the data that we have been provided signifies, along with your testimony, this isn't going to be the case. So why should I be optimistic when I have nothing substantiating these claims? Why should I be optimistic? I hear everybody talking about that there's going to be people coming at the door, but that's not what the studies have shown. And we don't know what they will show. And if they don't show it's going to be viable, the city may go forward with it anyway because they don't want B.F. Brown on their hands anymore. That is not a good reason to do this. So I have pushed and pushed and pushed for not housing. Low, moderate, high, I don't care. Commercial. Commercial. Our base is 15% commercial. That is why low medium and high wage taxpayers in our city are getting pinched every year on their tax bill because there's nothing in the base to siphon off their commitment. This won't correct that. It's just a fact of where we are. So if we want to be selfish with our properties, I will stake my claim on this one. Everyone I've talked to who said this can't be used for anything other than residential, 
can't tell me why or what the alternative is. I'll tell you what an alternative is, and it's not going to make people in this room happy. Demolishing the building. I talked to private developers, and I talked to Mr. Casassa, and I talked to business owners on Main Street. Their collective consensus opinion is the reason why we can't get anybody to buy our buildings in the private sector is because the cost of demolition, environmental cleanup, and permitting, once done, and then the new facility is constructed, the market value of that new facility is far less than what they put into it, which is why a project of this nature can only be done by an organization like the CDC. So we've got to ask ourselves, how do we correct that trend and help everybody in the city who's paying taxes? We need to start pushing for the other side of the ledger. And if that means we have to take some money out of stabilization, yes, I said stabilization, to knock down this property and others like it that blight the neighborhoods, bring down property values in those neighborhoods, are a place for vagrants and vandals, <coughs> Mr. Capasso said on February 3rd, his business is being impacted by that facility remaining the way it is. I couldn't agree more. Knocking it down will help out. Getting rid of it. Rezoning it commercial. And you watch how fast someone buys that lot. Because now when they buy it, their money goes immediately into construction. They don't have to deal with all the hassle. And for those who are afraid of using stabilization, given our poor financial history, I understand that. But stabilization is used for one of three things. Emergencies, capital investments, and one-time expenses. We have no money in our operating budget for demoing property, properties. That's another big reason why all of our property owners in this city are yelling and screaming because their values keep dropping. What are we doing about it? We're not doing anything about it. So we should start here. There is nothing to suggest for me that given all of the other facilities in the downtown area that we already have, this is going to bring economic development because all those others haven't brought economic development. We're still at 15%. I'm not being a negative person. I'm being a realist. It's not helped. We've got to ask ourselves why. This will not correct the issues we face. Whether it's high wage earners or low wage earners, it's not going to correct it at all. So the last thing I'll say about this is that when I was speaking to you, Mr. Casas, about this, the RFP, the RFP typically has five criteria. The fifth criteria was conveniently not in the RFP, and the RFP was written by our former housing director. Community development had no input in it. He wrote it. And the fifth criteria was left off. You know what that fifth criteria was? Unacceptable. The RFP doesn't have anything in it that says unacceptable. Any proposal we got would have been deemed acceptable. The proposal from the CDC was originally for 100% low-income housing. The city's own RFP stated 25% or more is least favorable but acceptable. So when someone like Councilor Boschman talks about low-income and all that stuff, let's understand something. The city of Fitchburg, who drafted the RFP, is saying that that is the least favorable option. And there's a reason they're saying that, because we need balance and we don't have it. But the RFP was written in a way that it can't be rejected. I have a problem with that. There should have been a fifth criteria in there that said unacceptable. 25% or more is least favorable. This is 70%. This is three times the amount the RFP said was least favorable. So why would I sit here and think that this is in the betterment of the city of Fitchburg? Again, if I can get studies and, and, and data that says 55 artists are waiting at the door to live in that facility, I vote for this. I don't have them. And the ones that I do have say, absolutely not. So that ruins the vision for me. And I'm going to play, the, the, I'm going to live in the land of Realville. I'm sorry, but my opposition to this is not anti-art, anti-culture, anti-low-income housing, anti-CDC. As much as everyone in the audience or at home listeners wants to paint me that way, they can. I can't help that, but that's not what this is about. This is about doing what is best for all the residents of Fitchburg and improving their tax bill. This won't do that. Thank you. Councilor Bean. Thank you, Mr. President, um, and thank you uh, for coming here tonight. You know, this is, I see this as a beginning process. I, I think, Mark, you said it best, is that until you own the property, or at least know you're going to own the property, you can't really do too much on studying or, or, or going out and, and looking. So I see this as, as first step, as many coming back for us to looking for uh, what's happening. But, you know, I look at it, the Art Museum and the CDC as two strong institutions that have been here in the city that have done well by us, by the city. The CDC with the Plymouth Street Project, the uh, Elm Street Project, and other projects you've done. The Art Museum with, with their commitment to the city and that. 
I see two strong partners coming together to do something about a, a, an area we have down there, which hopefully will become a better area and a more productive one um, with this project. Uh, is it going to be the end all? Is it going to be the, the, the panacea for all, for all? No, but I see it as, a, as hope and some vision. I talked to a friend of mine who was a former mayor from North Adams who talks about North Adams, which had a high unemployment rate, high uh, vacancy rate. Um, they did. They had Mass Mopa come in. Uh, they did. They did something similar to this, and it's been very successful. And now that there are high end, high end uh, products out there now. So, I, I see the risk uh, worth taking. Uh, otherwise, I see an empty building is going to stay there empty for another umpteen years. We see that with the Central Fire Station, others. We can go on and on. I just see. I, 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 I welcome you. I, I just see as hope. And again, I'm not waiting for the private sector to do something with that building. They're never going to do it. I think Councilor Dinatelli said it right. It's too expensive. That's why government really has to step in at some time to do the right thing. And I think we're doing the right thing by looking looking at this and hoping it works out. You know, hoping to go forward, see what your next steps are, see what you can do for for funding, and see what you can do uh, to help address some of the needs of the people there and, and, and look at the housing needs. So, I commend you. I I, I, I think it's honorable for you to for these two institutions come together and to help the city uh, move forward. So, appreciate you coming. Council agreed. In talking with Kelly Johnson, it, it really did open my eyes about the balance or imbalance that we have with housing in our unique community. So, I would like it to be cleared up just one more time that the three levels of housing that will potentially be in this building are subsidized, affordable, and market value. There's no writing or understanding that any of this is going to be low income housing. Now, my idea of low income and other idea of low income may be two different things. And I think they are very, um, especially in our area, it's really easy for us to paint a of who and what we think of low-income residents and I would like that to change. We heard from uh, Lando Lopez who is an artist attending school in Boston who said that he would welcome um, being able to live and or work and give back to the community here in Fitchburg. So again I too have talked with uh, private developers about that property and their thought is there's no reason to tear down the building to make it an empty lot because if they're going to put on a $15 million project, the $300,000 to tear the building down is a drop in the bucket for them. So they they didn't think that it would be of any value to for the city of Fitchburg to take on the cost of demoing the property to have it sit there as an empty lot that could be um, marketed to a commercial developer. So in saying that, I would like to hear again from you about the level of housing and the amount right now as the studies show that that facility would be divided up into. From me or from I, I don't know. Are they going to be the same number or are they going to be different? It would be better for you to answer <laughs> okay. the question. Mark, um, so right now, most of the Most of the tenants would have to have, so there's three levels. Mm -hmm. At a minimum, 30% of the units would have no income restrictions and no rental restrictions. So those apartments, depending upon their size, would rent roughly for, say, a thousand bucks, something like that. Okay. Most of the units, um, tenants would have to earn between twenty-five dollars and $50,000, depending upon their family size. The low would be $25,000 because they have to pay approximately 700 bucks in rent. So that's almost all of the balance of the units. And the high would be about 50,000 bucks because that's, as Mr. Casasa was saying, that's uh, the rent limits based on 80% of the area median income. And the area median income isn't just Fitchburg, but it also includes wealthier communities surrounding Fitchburg. So that drives what is that. that number? What is that 80% of our median income? What's that number? About $50,000. Okay. It depends on family size and uh, and it changes every year, but it's around fifty thousand dollars. So it's higher for a larger family, small lower for a smaller family. Um, so that would be roughly the highest. 
There would be also be a few units, um, seven or eight, um, that where the rent would be determined based on the person's income. And those few units, you know, so we have a mix of, of, of uh, all three different types. Um, and on that one, uh, the rents are uh, about 30% of the person's income. So would that person, again, if we're painting a demographic of who these people are going to be, that person would at least have to be able to work and bring in some sort of income? Right. Almost every of the 55 units, all but seven or eight, would have to earn at least $25,000 because they have to be able to pay that $700 in rent every month. And we will not, if we, you know, if we rent to somebody whose income doesn't reach that amount, they can't pay their rent. And if they can't pay their rent, we have to evict them. And it's not, uh, you know, we have operating expenses, um, all those different things that go with each unit. So we have to have the tenants paying rent uh, every single month. Would this project ever be able to house, let's say, um, an area business that was a 50C3, 501C3, right? property. <laughs> um, so t almost all of the CDC, I think every one of our projects right now pay full property taxes if that's what you're getting to. Um, so there might be a portion of this that we could, it, it's complicated about how we rent out a portion of it. So it would be possible, for example, that we could rent out a portion to the art museum, which is a 501c3 that could be there and, and uh, th that's possible. That's sort of uh, depends on what we do with the commercial space in the building um, and I we have to finish some more studies before I can answer how precisely that piece will go um, so would that would that be a possibility if there was a um, a business a nonprofit business that would be willing to rent space from this facility would that ever be able to be mixed in with this use of the building Yes, both a nonprofit or a for-profit could be potentially used. Uh, we could carve out a portion of this and finance it differently so that that carved out portion, uh, like the auditorium, um, could be rented to the art museum or could be rented to uh, artists who want just studio space, so it could just be an individual. Uh, that is definitely a possibility. That's something that we need to finish the market study to see what the demand is for that so we can determine what's the best use of that space. We need to attract as many artists as possible. We need to complete a very detailed market study in order to do that. If the market study showed a demand for that type of space, then we would design the project in such a way to allow that to happen. If the market study showed that there was a weaker demand for that, we would probably keep all that space in community space, um, not charge rent for it, and instead allow residents and others and the public uh, access to that space um, without charging for that. Again, not this is just thinking way outside the box, so forgive me, but is it feasible that City Hall could ever, the municipal offices of City Hall could ever be housed in this facility? Uh, yeah, I'm sure it's feasible. It wouldn't be the project that we're designing. I don't th think uh, City Hall's, I, I don't know how much space City Hall needs or any of those things, but I would think that would be, uh, it would take a course correction uh, to do that right now. Okay. And Larry, can I just get your personal, I mean, I know we've heard it, your personal opinion on whether this is a positive or a negative project? to take on as it sits right now in front of us? I think it has promise to be a, to be a project that will have a positive impact on, on Pittsburgh. I don't think it's a guarantee at this point because I think there are a lot of steps that have to be taken, a, a few hurdles that have to be cleared, and there aren't any guarantees involved. But I have confidence in the group, the team's ability to do that work. Um, and. Um, Frankly, I, I think that, that when, when Mr. Capasso stepped up to the plate at the prior meeting and made it very clear what the role of the art museum would be in attracting artists, that that erased one of my concerns about this project, that, that in fact um, 
that the art museum was willing to play a proactive role in trying to attract artists, and they have a, a wonderful network in the art community. And, and I, I really think that that adds tremendously to its prospects for attracting artists. I still think, as I, men as I mentioned, that the key is going to be uh, finding additional funding that doesn't come with the, with the strings that these other, other uh, the low-income housing tax credit program does, which locks up units for 25 years, and would effectively mean that if an artist was successful and earned too much income because they were successful, they would have to leave the unit. We, we want to have as many market rate units as possible so that it allows upward mobility of the artists that are living in those units. Um, and, I, and I believe that that's, that it's, it, we share the same goals here, that, we, that that's what we're trying to do here. Um, well, the, whether we'll succeed or not, I can't really tell you. All right, thank you. Councilor Joseph. Does, is the CDC going to be the operating um, manager of this building in the future? After the, if, if it happens, the project happens, do you see that as being the CDC's building for 20 years? Uh, so those are two different questions. Uh, we actually would, the short answer is we would put it, uh, the CDC would own it or we would be the general partner in an entity that owned it. As for operations, we generally hire an outside property manager that we control and contract with uh, because they're better at responding to middle of the night emergencies or health and safety issues uh, and they have you know, many thousands of units that they're looking at. So if there is an issue, we can do that. I think one of the pieces uh, would be how to operate the art space. And I think that's something that we need to finish the market study to see what role the art museum would play in that versus what role a traditional uh, property manager would play in that. That'd be something that's new and different about this space. As far as the residential units, they would be operated by uh, a property management company. What is the current success of 470 Main Street. I mean, you had when you built when you took over that building, and you did the project. There was a certain percentage of market rate, um, affordable, and no restriction. Where is that building at this point? So that was 31 residential units, two commercial units, um, the CDC space, and 470 Main Street. Um, 23 of the units are full, have no income restrictions and no rent restrictions. Seven of them have the same type of restrictions that I was describing to Councillor Green, where the rent uh, is based on a percentage of the person's income, and one unit is uh, rent that would be similar to the rents that are here that doesn't have any uh, support. The building is uh, operating uh, well. I think it's not, I think we had hoped that rents would have increased since we had uh, purchased the building and put it all into place and rents really haven't. Uh, nonetheless, the building is sort of operating at its uh, where uh, it should be and we're about to unwind the partnership uh, so that we can, uh, and we'll be done with, the, uh, with a lot of the restrictions connected with the funds that uh, came with that transaction. And what's your occupancy rate? At, at I think all, I mean, average. It's, it's between 90 and 100 percent. 90, really? Between nine, yeah, most of the time the units are full. Uh, one of the things about a market rate unit that's different from an affordable unit is that people move out of them more quickly. Um, so, you know, to put it in perspective, if everybody stayed in their apartment for three years, we would have 10 units turn over every single year. Because these are market rate units, people are driven by marriage, jobs, uh, all sorts of things that, you know, they're there, some of them are there for a long time, but a lot of people are there for a few years. That's why they have an apartment as opposed to a home. Right. Um, so the occupancy rates, I think we're doing a good job with marketing it to the market rate uh, tenants, and I think that's why we have confidence that we can do the same thing with um, uh, at, at this new project. We know that we have to put more money into advertising and uh, that sort of thing because there is more turnover in a market rate unit building than there is in a non-market rate building. So why why do you feel and or why in this proposal is there more of the affordable as opposed to the market rate where in that building you have more of the market rate than the affordable? Why are you marketing this or or looking studying this as being more affordable than market rate? 
Um, the financing structure has to be different for this project than it does for the other project. The other project used both historic tax credits and new market tax credits were the primary drivers. We can use historic tax credits, which are worth about a third, roughly, of the total cost for this building, which is why it's well worthwhile to preserve the building in its current state. Um, the new market tax credit program will not work in this building and uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, and so we can't use that uh, funding that was available for 470 Main Street. When do you, when, at what point do you say this is a successful project to go forward? What, what is your trigger from, if we go ahead and we sign to turn this, uh, there's a feasibility study, there's things that are going to happen. When do you determine whether CDC is going to take over this as a project? From, what's the timeline? Well, I mean, I think after tonight, we would say we're moving from sort of pre-development into development. We would be able to start spending more money to f do some of the studies that, you know, we don't have any, you know, we have to determine where our best use of our time and resources is. If we don't have the support of the council and the council doesn't want us here, uh, you know, we would rather invest those monies in another project. Um, if, you know, we need to have strong support from the residents and the citizens of Fitchburg to go forward with a complicated project like this. So uh, that's what we're hoping will happen tonight. At that point, we would engage the artist market study, which is uh, a lot more an expensive project than what we've been able to do so far to determine the lev level of artist housing. Um, we would also then begin um, work on preserving the building historically uh, and uh, looking at it environmentally. Uh, uh, those are probably the the historic piece and the artist market study piece are the two biggest hurdles for us. Uh, after that, we would then go back and pull together the f a financing plan that, working with the city, uh, would generate the um, you know the most number of market rate units, which is what we committed to in the in the project, and each sort of the way the development works is you're always trying to find the least expensive thing that will make the project not be feasible um, and uh, because then you haven't spent your money on something very expensive so that's sort of how we uh, picture it and as we go through the due diligence uh, after we go through each piece we'll then look to the next piece to say well what's the thing that's most likely to not make this project go forward ultimately you know we would then have to come back to the council for zoning approval um, which will be another hurdle. Uh, we'll also have to uh, convince all the lenders uh, to lend into the project as well. It's not just public. There is a fair amount of public funding, but we'll also have to have just plain old straight bank debt as well, and we have to make all those numbers work. Uh, there's finally, uh, and you know, we sort of have to answer some of the questions that Councillor Green raised about what's going to make sure that we attract the most number of artists is it renting out some artist studio space? Uh, because we see the key to this is the connection to the museum and that cachet that that brings, and that's the reason why somebody wants to come here as opposed to a building even at the other end of Main Street. I think there's a big difference to being next to a museum, all the support that museum is bringing uh, to both enhance the museum and to enhance the building, and we think those two things work uh, together. Uh, so. I think those would be sort of our uh, thought process as we're going through this. So if March 24th is the day that the council says that they support this proposal, when do you see at a point where CDC says, I can go forward with this project? Uh, the day the shovel goes in the ground? <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, you never know till you're yeah. closed. Okay, so you have no timeline that says, if I don't have anything if I don't have financing by October 1st, if I don't have um, zoning, or I don't have this by 1st of September, then that's it? I mean, do you have a date that you're looking at to say, this is when I will deem this project to be feasible? I know it's feasible because we've gotten that far, but the, this will be the date when you say this is a project that we're going to go with? Uh, so to answer that question, I would think that there's a fair amount of work that's done in sort of the first year that we should be able to, I'm hoping we can get through a lot of these feasibility studies. Uh, and after that, it probably is a little bit of what I would call waiting in line 
um, for other pieces to fall into place that we expect to fall into place, but that may take extra time. So I would hope that within a year, uh, maybe 18 months, we would be able to answer all of those questions. So by that, I would think we would have to have zoning. We would have to have some kind of preliminary indication from funders that they thought the project could go forward. Uh, we would have to have the artist market study indicating that it would go, uh, it would be able to go forward, and we'd have to have sign off from the historic. Uh, that we'd be able to access all the historic credits, and that the National Park Service had signed off on our design. That that design could also will meet the historic standards. I think those are the critical things. Sort of, you never know. There could be an environmental problem. Um, that pops up that you have to deal with. There could be other issues as well. But those are sort of, I think, the three bigger things. And I would say that's a year to 18 months. And then I think it'll take, it could take, as uh, Mr. Casasa said, longer than that. I expect it, it, I shouldn't say it could, it will take longer than that to actually close and to get a shovel in the ground and all the rest of that. With your track history, you have my support. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Councilor Clark. Uh, I, actually, Councilor Joseph uh, asked a few of the questions that I was going to ask. The only thing I wanted to add, Mark, is that you do have a track record, and it's a good one. And I think I said before, I have a lot of faith in you and this project, um, and I'll be voting for it tonight. Thank you. Thank Councilor you. Boschman. Mark, a question. When you talk about families, are, are you saying one child? Two kids, three kids, four kids, five kids, six kids per unit? Uh, no, the mix, uh, so I assume you're asking about who we would rent to. So the mix of units in this is designed really for artists. So it's about 20 one-bedroom units, about 28 two-bedroom units, and seven three-bedroom units. That's roughly what we have now. One of the things that we found from the 470 Main Street project is that two-bedroom units are oftentimes more desirable for the little extra money that you have to rent, even if it's uh, to just uh, a single person. They oftentimes like a study or uh, something. You know, they just want a little bit more space. So uh, that's how we've designed the unit mix that we have. Now, my question, because this is all new to me. How long does this program stay into effect? Is it for the next 10 years, 20 years, 25, 30? Of 40, where it has to stay market rate, low to moderate income, and low income. Is it how many years do we have to, does the city have to stay that way? Uh, so I think that's one of the things that we've been working on with Mr. Casasa is exactly to figure out which source of funds that we'll be using. Every source of funds has a different length. Um, uh, some, the Longest, I believe, at the state is 40 years. So depending upon which, how we divide up the sources of funds into which units, uh, you can have, I would say that would be sort of the longest one. Uh, maybe there's a 50-year source, too. I don't know. Uh, but that would, that's part of what we need to work out with Mr. Casasa and the plan department. And oftentimes, it's in the developer's best interest as well to uh, have those sources lined up uh, so that you can put as many of the longest, and we will have to do that in this project, the longest sources will all be targeted to the fewest number of units possible. So that's how we did 470 Main Street. So there are 40-year deed restrictions on there. They're targeted to those seven or eight units as opposed to the balance of the building. Now, I got one other question, because it makes it sound like I get the impression that people think I'm against poor people, and I'm not against poor people. I was poor, and my shoes used to talk to me. But the way I look at it, uh, and Steve's going to get mad at me, is because I don't think we have opportunity in the city of Fitchburg for everybody. It's only for elected few, and I argue about bringing in low-income housing. That's why I, I don't think we, we lack the skills. And my question to you is, uh, I forgot, because I get all nerved up. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I listen to you talk, and I hear you talk, and I ask these questions, I keep on asking these questions, and like Councilor Di Natale says, if, if I get more market rate housing, more market rate housing, and you can't rent them, you're a businessman, just like I'm a businessman. If I can't rent my fourth family, I'm losing money. 
So what happens if, you, if people come in to see these units and they say, I don't want to rent them? The market rate. Who are you going to put in? Are you going to put in moderate rate or are you going to put in low income? Uh, well, that's an issue we have with every, you know, every landlord has that exact same question. And I think that's something that we look at every year as we're setting our rents. Any landlord does the same thing. Are you better off lowering the rents a little bit to attract more people? Or are you better off keeping the rents at the same level and hanging tight? Uh, certainly, uh, you know, so we're every month we look at those figures. We're always uh, checking what the turnover, the vacancy loss, all of those things that are part of uh, every single you know, real estate deal uh, anywhere in the state. So I don't have an answer for you, but it's something that we would study very carefully and we would make a decision. Are we better off changing the rent from $1,000 to $900? Or are we better off giving somebody a free month's rent uh, and they can move in and get 12 months, 13 months free? Are we better off giving people a, you know, a new refrigerator? You know, there's all sorts of different marketing things that people do, and that's part of why these market studies are so important, because it could really hurt the agency if we don't have, uh, you know, if we've projected that wrong. I think we feel fairly confident because we've had a, a good history with a market rate building that we know what the rents are that we're going to be able to get, and I think we feel pretty good about being able uh, to do that. In fact, one of the things we're proud of is that there's a couple other market rate buildings moving in because those lenders, in addition to us, there's lenders looking over our shoulder because they're lending money on this. And a lot of people have seen what we've been able to get at 470 Main Street and have designed their other buildings on River Street and other places based on our rents. And the rent structures are all fairly similar. Now, one other question. I remember talking to the last time you first approached the council, and I was under the impression that and correct me if I'm wrong, that if Paul Boschman was on Section 8, that you would take Section 8 because that meets your qualification because I get X amount of people paying this kind of money. If you're getting $1,000, they'll pay $950, and I give you a check for $75, whatever the rent is. Is that the way I must, or did I misinterpret you on the last time we talked? So we have seven units, uh, seven or eight units in this project that will be that way. If there's another tenant who just came to us who wanted to take section, who had a section eight certificate and wanted to move in, uh, that would be a decision we would make at the time based on, you know, all the qualities and everything else related to that particular tenant. So in this case, for example, if it was an artist who had a section eight certificate, since this is an artist preference building, uh, you know, I would think that they would be able to, uh, you know, that would be, I don't think we're going to discriminate against people who have a Section 8 certificate. But that's not our marketing plan or anything like that to go off to ask people with Section 8 certificates to move into it. Uh, it's not, even if we wanted it to be, lenders won't let, rely, let us, they won't lend money based on that plan. So they need to make sure that we're actually paying our debt service and that our, their debt's going to be paid. And that's really what drives this whole thing is you need investors and you need somebody who's going to actually lend the money. Um, the CDC is putting some of our own money into this, but you need outside lenders as well. Thank you. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. The caddy. <clears throat> I think the city's at risk having these empty buildings, first of all. I think it's, it's dangerous, it's blighted, it looks terrible. You know, what if the art museum didn't renovate their building? What if Fitchburg State University didn't renovate their buildings? Where would the city be today? I, th I think, personally, the, the buildings are beautiful. You've got the stables, you've got the B.F. Brown building, and you've got the Academy Street School. The city has to take a chance in this. And, and I question, what's our risk in this? We have someone before us that tells us they're going to spend between 50 and $20 million to clean up a piece of property across the street from the art museum, next to an elderly high rise, next to a low play playground, and next to a, this, a side of the city that's starting to renovate with new buildings. The city isn't at risk with this. Are we at risk because there might be nine low income housing units in this building. I, 
when, when you go other places in Massachusetts, you go to Cambridge. Cambridge, <coughs> there's a lot of low-income people in Cambridge, a lot of public housing, and you go to, to Davis Square, it's vibrant, it's, it's full of people. Last year I went to uh, North Hampton, and the day I went to North Hampton, there were hundreds of people on Main Street, hundreds. And in the center of Main Street, there's this massive church, and they were holding um, a dinner for homeless. And everybody was fine. There's, what's, what are everyone so afraid of? And if you look around about tearing down buildings, we have a central fire station that needs to be torn down. The fire alarm building needs to be torn down. The Water Street Fire Station needs to be torn down. The Rollstone Street School needs to be torn down. There's plenty of places to tear down. I, I, I'm, I'm all for this project 100%, and I agree with you. The city has to get behind you. In order for this to work, everybody has to get behind this project. On the outskirts of our city, we have hundreds of, of uh, condominiums. Rosedown Street, Franklin Road, and every day all of those people go somewhere else to go to dinner to spend their money because we have nothing here. It's time we put something here. We, you, you've got to create something for people to go to. This is just, is this, I agree with, with Council Bean, this isn't the, the, the answer to everything, but it's a start in the right direction. The, the city, no one's come to save us. We've got to save ourselves. Thank you. Councilor Bezal. Uh, thank you. I, I totally agree with Councilor Caddy. You know, I emailed um, Larry a while back. Central Steam Plant, Rollstone Street School, Farmer City Central uh, Fire, Farmer Alarm Building, and BF Brown. It would cost us to tear down those buildings, a guesstimate, of $1.3 million to $1.6 million to demolish them. When you're looking at a stabilization fund, a third of our stabilization fund would be used to demolish these buildings. And not on top of all the other buildings that Councilor Boschman put on. So I think that doing something well um, with this building is, is the best thing to do. Um, also, when it comes to low-income housing, uh, many of you might know I had six sisters and five brothers. 75% of my family still lives in the area. You know you have a big family when you can say percentages. Uh, <laughs> they eat here, they shop here, they own houses. They, they, it's got nothing to do with the income. I had great parents, great upbringing. It's got nothing to do with income and, and I wish that people would get off of that stigma because uh, there's nothing wrong with not having money. It's what you do in the future with it. So, um, so I have a couple questions. So when I'm looking at creative industries in, in Massachusetts already has defined some of these. And it's uh, marketing, architect, visual arts and crafts, designs, film and media, digital games, music and entertainment, and publishing. What are you envisioning to have in this particular center for creative industries that could grow within the city? Well, part of that is going to depend on the marketing survey and what kind of information we get back about the kinds of artists who would like to be in this building. Um, so we haven't come up with a list, but as Mark and I have talked about it, we want, to, we want to cast the net as widely as possible, and it would represent something along the lines of, of the list of professions that you just quoted, Councillor Beasel, rather than being specifically for painters or sculptors. It, it would also be for performing artists. Okay. For dancers, musicians, writers. Now I know uh, they meet every so often the Massachusetts Great Economy Council meeting. Is anyone planned from our city to go to that? Do you know of? I think there's one coming up in June or July. Um, can you talk to that Eugene about your meeting with uh, the Baker administration? Yes. This is, this is Eugene Finney who is the uh, director of Marketing and Communications for the Art Museum and also a resident of the city of Fitchburg. All right, thank you. Um, well, very recently I've um, 
been involved with a group called Mass Creative, which is a uh, lobbying firm for the arts and arts funding here in the state. Uh, and uh, two weeks ago, I was able to meet with um, Deputy Secretary um, of the administration and uh, talk to her about different types of arts funding and different programs that are available. Um, and through my involvement with this organization, I attend regular meetings and so forth uh, like this. Uh, and actually tomorrow there's a very large event down at the State House. Um, so when opportunities and different meetings like this come up, um, as we're expanding um, our understanding of, of what the creative economy and what creative initiatives can do in this t in in the city and in the state, uh, we do plan to uh, participate and and be active with those meetings. Okay, thank you. Um, also, going back to, I know I talked about this a little before with the Boston uh, Redevelopment Authority. Um, they actually put deed restrictions. Um, on these buildings, are you, is there going to be a deed restriction on this building for artistry housing? Uh, no, there can't be a deed restriction, but there can be a preference. So we will have a preference. Um, so I don't know exactly how the Boston model works with the deed restriction, but there will be a artist preference, and that will be something that we'll be working with the art museum in the city to make sure that we're defining what an artist is uh, and that that preference is enforced. Okay. And the other thing I talked about was um, people that um, actually rent there are actually required to have an artist certificate. Uh, and I noticed uh, in the paperwork that we handled that the, the art museum is actually going to be um, have a designer system to actually vet the artist residents. Uh, do you, or would you include people from the local neighborhood and sort of being on the board. Uh, so I know that the church down there has a, a, a big vested interest in that area, and there's other organizations down there. Can you envision having a board where people would have to go and talk about what they're doing and what they plan on doing? Yes, we, we haven't, again, we're early in the process. We haven't developed the actual vetting process that we will use we will use models from other cities like um, Boston. I mean, we're not reinventing the wheel here. Um, and I am sure that, you know, because the, the museum has become so community invested and because of the mission of the CDC, there will certainly be community representation on any kind of vetting panel. Okay. And I also noticed in the agreement that um, the art museum is taking on a huge amount of responsibility in this. And, uh, I want to thank you, first of all, for doing that. But I, I do also want to let you know that uh, the city needs to stand behind you. And if you feel you're not getting the support that you need, then we need to do something about it. I know uh, talking to people about um, giving people a chance and this and that, we need to help ourselves with this project. And not just, once the billing is gone, wipe our hands of it and say, that's it, it's gone, somebody else's problem. and. Uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of excited about this. It's something new. Uh, I know that, um, you know, from, from Larry, from your point of view, if you went out and started to do a survey on this in the area, uh, there's probably nobody else in this area that's doing this. Um, so we could be breaking some ground here in Fitchburg. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Dinatelli. Well, I'm glad everybody listens to what I have to say because distortions get thrown out all the time. No one ever said we're in fear. I'm not going to bed at night with the blanket over my face going, oh my God, more low-income people. Um, kind of sad I even have to say that, but that's how the game is played in politics, I guess. Uh, I guess when I said the word imbalance, that was classified as I don't like low-income people. We have an imbalance in the downtown, and our tax base and the way Main Street currently is constituted reflects that. <coughs> so I know facts are difficult to listen to, but... That's just the reality, and that's not Marcus Natale's opinion. That's the acting director of community development's opinion and other business owners in the downtown area, not mine. I'm just relaying the information. Number two, I'm going to make a motion that the agreement be amended to reflect for the purpose, uh, amend uh, section 20A of the agreement to read, for the purpose of certified artist housing only for 48 of the 55 units. Motion is for the agreement to state only art professionals other than the restricted units. I'll 
I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second to amend O2151, section, section 20 2, 20A for the purpose of certified artist housing. Certified artist housing. I'm not sure about that. Forty-eight certified artist housing only for forty-eight of the fifty-five units. For forty-eight of the fifty-five units. And speaking to speaking to the motion, Councillor Joseph. Uh, just speaking on the motion, I, I don't want to tie their hands in any way when they go to lenders to determine how they're going to get the funding for this. If they find that that's the feasible way of doing it, then they'll already go and do that that way anyways. I have full faith that they'll do that. But I'm not going to put a clause on this to tie their hands when they go to lenders. Councilor Dean Talley. My motion is simply to show my support of the art museum and the art community. And if this is what the vision is, that's what the agreement should say. Because if there aren't going to be artists living here, it's going to be just like everything else. And there's not going to be any vision or vitality or cultural revival. So I'd like everybody to basically put their money where their mouth is. Thank you. Council Kushmarek, you were next on the agenda, on my agenda, to speak before the motion. Do you want to speak to the motion or would you like to wait until that vote is taken and then I'll speak? I'll wait until that vote is taken. Thank you. And Council Bean, are you speaking to the current motion? Sure. Council Bean. Speaking to the motion. I mean, I hear a second to two. I, yes, I like Jody Council seconded. Bean Natale's motion. Do I think but I'm concerned about what effect it may have on the project itself. Until we have some more feasibility studies and market, the market studies in, I don't want to all of a sudden handcuff you, because I think the sense I get from you, you is that you want the same thing we want. We want to have artists in there, we want to have a vibrant, you know, a vibrant neighborhood, we want to have a vibrant uh, artist community, and I trust you, and, I, and, I, and I, I've seen your work before. So, you know, and again, a lot of people say, well, you know, <clears throat> you know, uh, you know, why are we doing this and that? I think we should do it. We have a vision. I mean, I look back, and again, I'm not the oldest because I know Council Boschman's older than I am. But I'm one of the old, I'm, I'm one of the oldest here on the council, and I've seen things. And I and I can remember North Street corridor when we first started that. Everybody, you know, oh, what are we doing down there? You know, but it was government that took the lead. The government that we took down the Simon Sarn Steel Building. We created an atmosphere for for hopefully new growth. We we engaged the university. We began changing that neighborhood because 20 years ago you wouldn't walk your dog down that street but today it, it is what it is and it's a vision and it's a commitment and I'm willing to do that for the BF Brown area because I, I don't see anything else I don't see what else we can do other than this and I have I my trust that I think we're going to do the right thing and if it's not going to work out we'll know soon um, if, if it's not feasible we know soon but I've seen it work in other communities like I, I mentioned North Adams it's worked out there they're no big uh, you know they're not a, a metropolitan you know they're not they're not a, a large city um, they had a lot of things going against them like we have here, but they made it successful after, you know, years and years of trying. And those units now were, were, were artist lofts going out for one something. They're at $300,000 now. There's, a, there's demand for that. for that. It took some time, but there's demand for that artist lofts now. I, you know, call me a visionary, call me something like that, but I've seen it before. I've been around long enough to know that we need to make a commitment. Government has to be part of it because it can't be done alone. And I feel very confident that, you know, that you know, we don't need these restrictions that we're putting on here. That I think that you you get the message from us that that's what we want, and you'll try and do your best to do that. Thank you. I'll speak to the motion in that I will be voting against it. Um, I believe that the uh, Mark and and Nick both understand what the the city wants, and if we are in partnership with them, we have to uh, trust them and we have to have faith in them that they are going to do what is in the best interest of the CDC what is in the best interest of the art museum, and that is what is in the best interest of the city of Fitchburg regarding this project. And for us to put handcuffs on them regarding their ability to get funding, because we've changed this in, in um, amended in the proposal, I think it is, would be inappropriate and uh, would create an environment that would make it less likely for them to be successful and I think we want to create the environment that allows them to be successful. Councilor Boschman, speaking to the motion. Speaking to the motion. First of all, Larry, what do you think about the motion? Well, as, as a practical matter, Councilor, I, I do agree with what Councilor Joseph said at the, at the very outset. Um, it, while there may be a will, to uh, ensure that the highest number of um, artist, artist units are created. If you start with that stipulation, it's 
going to be impossible to obtain financing from a number of different sources because they um, they obviously want the units to be rented and the more you restrict it the the more uh, restrictive they're going to be about providing financing okay and one other thing I want to make it very clear mr. president I'm not against poor people I'm not against poor people I want that clear what I'm saying to you they're moving out businesses are moving out and they're going to different Council, communities Council, being against the poor, no, no, being against poor people or supporting poor people is not the essence of the motion for the amendment oh, well I just want to make it very clear Thank you. We have a motion and a second to amend O2115. All those in favor? All those opposed? Nine in opposition. Make a motion to amend 20, section 2080 of the agreement to state that the economic development director and the city council by a majority vote have to approve the studies proving its viability after six months. Second. We have a motion and a second. What's the number, Marcus? I'm sorry. 20A, Economic Development Director, and a majority vote of the City Council have to approve the viability of the feasibility study. That the City Council and the Economic Development Director Must have to approve, approve the, studies. the viability yeah. studies. After six months. After six months. Speaking to the motion, Councilor Bean. Uh, I just want to, um, I, I thought I heard Mark say this could take anywhere from a year or so to get these studies done. Um, I don't want to restrict them to six months and all of a sudden you know, we're putting putting where a place I can't be. Um, I would um, I'd be against that motion. Again, I don't want to hand tie them. I think they're willing to work with us as partners as they have in other projects. I trust them. I, I, I've seen uh, they've demonstrated their commitment to the city. I don't think they're going to do anything that uh, that that we that uh, that we're going to be opposed to um, without coming to us first uh, to give us a heads up. Um, I just feel that this six months would be restrictive, and uh, I'd be voting against it. And for the record, uh, I don't think this is about poor people versus rich people or whatever. I think it's about a neighborhood, uh, an art museum, um, and, and trying to create something from that from that vision. I don't care who lives there. I just think we need a, a change in that neighborhood, and this is a positive, the most positive change I've seen in years. So thank you. Councilor Dean Telly. I said six months because the current agreement says six months. It doesn't say who gets to decide if it's valuable or not. There's absolutely no language in there. It's vague as to who's going to say this is going to fill art fill with artists. And it said six months. So if you want to make it a year, fine, make it a year. But I want some safeguards in place from either the council or the economic development director when that person comes in to certify that this this study is going to be for arts arts only. Or for the majority of it's going to be arts. Right now it says nothing. It says the city of Fitchburg would mean anything. And just for the record, I do trust you gentlemen very much. You know, it's like, this has nothing to do with trust. This has to do with the fact that right now as it currently stands, we have absolutely no evidence to support that this is going to do what it says it's going to do. Thank you. I, just I'd, like to, one second. I'd like to comment first, <laughs> then, then we'll move to the motion. Um, I would just like to say that I don't believe that the economic development director and or the city council should or needs to determine for the CDC and the art museum how they interpret the viability studies that are presented to them which will help them to determine whether they move forward or they don't move forward. <coughs> um, this motion that, that was made and seconded um, then is it going to come forward in the other direction that says if the CDC and the art museum determine that the viability studies tell them that they shouldn't go forward, that the city of Fitchburg and the economic development director then have the ability to tell them that they have to? Um, it's their decision. They're the ones who are doing the work. They're putting the money up. They are making the risk. They are paying for and getting the studies. They will take those studies and they will make a determination. Speaking of the motion. Council Bean. And, and Council Dean Natale, um, I'd like to see if you would accept a, accept a friendly amendment to a year, possibly, um, on that. Because right now, the, the agreement does say six months that they have to come back to us. Um, if the seller is not, where is it here? Uh, the buyer shall have six months from the date of this agreement to provide seller the studies outlined in, in clause, whatever it is. So 
according to the current contract we have before us, it is six months. I'd like to amend it to 12 months to give them the opportunity to uh, give them a little bit more time. Council, that would be a separate motion than what the, the councilors is. If you, well, it's if, almost the same. Yeah, almost, but it's, right. in, in my opinion, it's different in that you just want to give them more time. Right, right now, so six, they have to come, in, come back in six months right. and we can but, add, give but, an extension but, but or the, not. But the motion that's on the floor isn't just about time. It's about us ha having approval, which is the same approval. Thing. Right. The only approval he's asking is to add in, because right now it's a city I, council, I understand. add an economic development director, which I think is a, I don't have a problem with that. I'm just saying I'd be willing for a friendly amendment to go to the 12, 12 months, but that's just my feeling. Mr. Barrett. Just, just a point of clarification, if it's going to be, if, if the motion does pass, if it's going to be a majority of the council and the economic de development director, how, how does that uh, work out if it's a five, uh, people for or against it and the economic development director is against it and it's the six it's a majority of the council saying we we do want to go forward with it that just wanted to point that out i don't know how that would be resolved council dean Taylor. i will amend it to just be the economic development director and they have a year but let's understand something what was said earlier it's already in the agreement that says the city of fitchburg will determine if it's viable or not who is the city of fitchburg who is it no one knows here who that is I didn't come up with that clause. That was in there. And again, it's in there for a reason. Because the studies conducted already from our acting development director of com uh, community development have stated it's invalid. So that's why it's in there. So I'd like to clarify who is going to be making the determination that these next studies are going to prove valid because the ones already that they've submitted haven't. And uh, I'm okay with the one-year time frame, but let's, let's specify in the agreement who's going to make this decision. Because right now, we don't know who's going to make the decision. I think that's pertinent information. Counselor, just for clarification for Anna and myself, you're changing your motion. I would like to change to my motion in one year, one year and only the economic, only development, the economic director. development director. Yes. We have a motion and a second on the table to amend 02115. 20A. Yep. The economic development director, director must, must approve, approve the studies. study viability studies of the project with, within one year. Within one year? Within one year. All those in, oh, oh Council, Council Green speaking to the motion? Yes. Is there somewhere in the contract where there is a definition of sellers? Or who, you know, the sellers? Like where does it say city council or the mayor or economic development? Because that is, that is pretty pertinent. Like who, who decides, you know, who's, who's the cop? You know, I see. On one of the, you know under number 23 if to seller at the following address and it li lists you know mayor Wong seller that's the only thing that I see of the terms of who is the seller the successor counselor if I can direct you to the, the actual purchase and sale agreement clause 20a that's been referenced earlier it does say if seller is not satisfied that the project can be developed as artist housing, as outlined in the proposal dated October 15, 2014, which is incorporated herein by reference, the seller may terminate this, this agreement within six months of the date of the agreement. Now, in the October 15, 2014 commitment letter from the CDC, and this was the result of the ongoing discussion with the RFP selection committee, this was the compromise, if you will, to try to make it a better project, uh, the CDC committed the following language. Upon completion of the study, what re references that there will be a, um, the CDC will commission an artist market study by art space or an equivalent firm to demonstrate the viability of creating artist preference housing and to de determine the best type of artist to attract to the building. The design and oversight of the market study will include active participation and representation from the city and the Fitchburg Art Museum. Upon completion of the study, the CDC will seek to establish a partnership with the Art Museum to enhance its marketing efforts and create, a meaningful pro create meaningful programmatic incentives which will, to the satisfaction of all parties, successfully attract the type of artist identified in the study. As partners in this project, the city and CDC will have six months from the execution of the purchase and sale agreement to determine that the market study has been completed and that the project can successfully attract artists to the project. The city may withdraw from this agreement prior to that date if the city's designated representative is not satisfied that the market study demonstrates a feasible project as outlined in the CDC's response to the RFP. 
this time frame may be extended with the agreement of both parties. So, so, so uh, in this case, the only unknown is, is who the designated representative would be. All set? Um, who's the seller? I mean, I, I City of Fitchburg. City of Fitchburg but is the seller. Is that all of us? Is that all of us plus the neighborhood, plus the residents? Who's the seller? Yeah. Excuse me. Thank you. Mr. Barrett. I want to speak to that, Mr. President. Uh, it is sometimes can be confusing because the, the city you know, has to act corporately and the council has a role and the mayor has a role. Typically, when we have a situation like this, uh, you know, when we're trying to set what the ground rules are, f uh, that the uh, what the the um, contingencies are for the sale of the property, the council approves those contingencies in the purchase and sale, and then it is left up to the executive, the mayor, to basically implement that. So I, I would say that if the council approves this agreement, the ultimate determination about whether or not the contingencies have been uh, uh, satisfied would be made by the mayor. Okay, thank just, uh, you. Representing okay. the city. Yes. Could you just rephrase or re restate the current uh, the motion, motion that's on, on the floor? floor? Right, because there's been some iterations, and I'm not sure which one we have Correct. for us. The motion, motion on the floor is to change 20A to say that the economic development director must approve the viability studies of the project within one year. Just a clarification, it also says in here that, the, that that person has the right to extend it also if possible. Yeah. Is that still clear? Okay, that's, I'm fine with that. Council motion? Who is that person? And who are we going to make the designated the, person? The economic development director position has not been um, filled yet. It is coming before the uh, council next week. Oh, I don't know if I like that. Okay. We have a motion and a second to amend O2115. All those in favor? All those opposed? Nine in opposition. Motion to move. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve 2115. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Two in opposition. Move we adjourn, Mr. President? Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? We are adjourned. Everybody stay seated.